Thanks, Tim, for the stools and for the introduction and for <laughs> the hospitality you've shown. Thanks to all of you for the hospitality over the last week. Um, I know for my part, I've, I've deeply appreciated the generous engagement, the searching questions, the sometimes critical objections. Wilton, where are you? <laughs> it's been a really um, special week, and I've really enjoyed spending it with you. And I just also just want to thank you so much for the, I mean, it's just a privilege and honor to be here and um, to let an artist have the, the, the moments to share to you. There's so much knowledge in this room and so much insight in this room. And yet you let that happen. And I thank you for that. And Tim, thank you for that kind introduction as well. It's very kind. Thank you. So I'm excited about this next um however, 30 minutes, I guess, that we have. And um, we've been, over the last week, we've, we've encountered um, beautiful art and so singing and spoken word. And we've um, talked a lot about art and beauty. And um, what I'm excited about about the next 30 minutes is that we have a chance to try to let art speak and see what it might say to us during this final session of Arts Week. And I think that Dawn's art speaks to me so powerfully. So I, I look forward to sharing this conversation with you. So I've been looking over her pieces. And I wanted to start by thinking about a couple pieces that she did um, during her time at South Bend. Um, both this piece, which is also right here, um, and it's called You See Me, and this piece, um, Into the Deep. So I wanted to start with this pairing, which are both about landscapes and about the landscape of Big Bend. And I wanted to start by just asking you to reflect on why is it that your paintings are always, or most of the ones I've seen about landscape, what draws you to landscape as your subject? And um, you know, it's a, I love these questions, so we could just talk 30 minutes on this one. <laughs> so, a reel me in here, but no, landscape is, um, I discovered that through a process of working through a mentor of mine, um, that I just kept coming back to the landscape. I was birthed in a place where there was a, under the shadow of a volcano, um, and, and that had a deep effect on me as a small child. And then growing up in a very um, big city with a lot of slums, I was not able to see that kind of beauty uh, for the other half of my childhood. And, and those two themes ran through my life. And I, I remember going to college and trying abstract art, and I, I loved it. I wanted to be Mark Rothko. Um, I, I'm not at Mark Rothko, I know that, but I loved him, and I still do. Um, but, but I remember when I worked with this particular woman, Susan Hooks was her name, is her name, and uh, she just said, Don, you're a quandary to me. I, you have th all these styles. And she's like, talk to me about them. So I did. And one of them was the landscape. And she just stopped me when I started to talk about the landscape. She said, your voice changed when you started to talk about the landscape. And having somebody to name that to me, mm -hmm. to point that out to me. Um, I didn't know that, but it was my window. And I look at it now as it's my window into the spiritual. Um, the, the landscape has become that window. And then when I look back at, at the, the artists that I love the most, uh, Mark Rothko, of course, was one, but George O'Keefe was definitely my favorite. And, um, and she became such a, every time I start to get insecure about my work, I'd look at her and think, all right, I can do it. <laughs> you know, because she did it. And, um, just with, with bold colors and um, freedom, you know, and, and I, I, love, I love that about her work. And so the landscape gives me that freedom, yeah. Yeah. Of course, her, her work is often about these very little things that she makes very big, um, little flowers. And you have these paintings with these huge subjects, and especially these two from Big Bend. Um, they're landscape paintings, but they're as much the sky as they are the land. More sky, really, in these two than land. And um, it seems that uh, with so much sky, you're exploring light in really interesting ways. They're both kind of luminous. I mean, I was struck 
um, having seen um, Don's paintings over um, in digital images and then seeing them in person, um, I encourage you to come up afterwards and look more closely. I mean, it almost looks like they're emanating light, especially uh, you see me. And I wonder if you can t t talk to us some about how light works for you in your paintings and why this luminosity, which is so vivid, especially in You See Me and, and Into the Deep, but seems to move throughout your corpus. Thank you. I love that question, too. I've, I've been thinking about that. And um, Monet said, and of course, looking at the Impressionists who are just wanting to capture light, light, light was their major arcing theme for their work. And Monet said, you can't paint the light. You must use color. And that always has been a real hinge point to me that, that um, I've had people come up to my work and say, is there a backlight on it? You know? And I think, no. You know, you know like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know like, like I'm thinking, what? You know, but, but I, I do understand one, one thing that I, I think I, I see in Monet's work as well, and I liked it. He keeps, us, he keeps the light clean. And it is the first thing I paint is light in the painting, and then I leave it alone. Um, the luminous quality of it, and it usually takes about, I mean, just an example, the you see me takes, you know, up to a dozen layers, you know, and I have to wait and let it dry, and then the next layer. Um, and those are, what I liked about Rothko is this whispering layer that he could do so well, and you don't see it until you see a real Rothko, and it's just layered that's just like breathed onto the canvas. And I love that quality, and I'm, I'm trying to do that with my skies. I look at sky as a place of, of searching, uh, abstract in a way, but it's also this deep thing. I say a lot of times there is sky, and then there is deep sky, just as there is beauty, and there is deep beauty. You have to look deep, <laughs> you know, and um, when I was in Big Bend, the lights would change colors, the, the different stars. Uh, my husband and I got it. We had an army blanket, and we just laid it out on the ground, and we just started watching the stars come out, and like the Lord just dumped his glitter box out, right? But, but it was red and green and blue and all the yellows, and, you know, and it was just amazing to me. I thought, oh, how much are we missing with the light? And um, there's, there is a such thing as light pollution, you know, I don't know if you know you know this, but uh, Las Vegas is dome of light is it's it's ruined the night skies for Death Valley National Park. They they can't have the gold tier night skies that they used to, but they're in Big Bend. Little plug for Texas. We have those gold tier night skies. That means it is the best viewing sky for light. But yeah, I think there's something to the light of for me of of a spiritual God hope. Yeah. I wanted to ask you more about seeing and looking. Um, you know, you mentioned Monet, and he said something when he was asked about his style of painting. I just paint what I see. And of course, that's both true and not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to the pond that Monet is painting, you're not going to see a Monet painting. <laughs> you're going to see a pond. And, I, and similarly with um, going to Big Bend, if you go to Big Bend, you're... Um, you're not looking at your paintings, you're looking at the natural world. And can you say something about what's the difference between going to Big Bend and looking at the sky and looking at your paintings of Big Bend? Right, that's a good question. And um, I have to say, when I got to Big Bend, um, my husband and I were camping out, and the evening sky was coming down. And I, don't, I know you probably know this, but the light bends on those golden times, those sunrise and sunset, the light bends. There's something spiritual to me about when it bends, it's most beautiful. Um, and that golden hour, and I noticed this beautiful mountain was glowing. And um, my husband said, Don, look, I, ha I was op trying to open a canister to eat, and I looked up and I went, whoop, and I remember dropping <laughs> because of this beauty. And and my husband, and, and so we were standing there, and I just started to cry. And he goes, what? What's wrong? And I said, how am I going to paint this? <laughs> I don't know how to do this. You know, and, um, and something that I think the Lord used, he, he used my husband to speak over me. He said, Don, you don't have to. You don't, you don't have to. You just agree with God in it. And that's really how I feel when I paint, is I'm, I'm just agreeing with him in it. I, I have to take it into me. 
and then release it back out. And it, it's as if I had to ingest that beauty um, to fully like hold, hold it and uh, release it. And sometimes I try to highlight some certain things that I really wanted you to see. And this is where Georgia O'Keeffe comes in because she helps you see that interior of the flower or the way the curve of the mountain hits against a contrasting color and all of a sudden it pops. Well, and that's, that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm helping you see, I, I hope, just helping you see, look what's there, what God did so quickly. And it took me, you know, months <laughs> to do it. But yeah, that. Thank you. I, I, I want to bring a couple other paintings in the discussion that have a, a different background. Well, they're both these two. So while I'm getting them on the screen, you can see them. Um, they're called Frayed and Emancipation. And um, they're from a different setting. So maybe you can start by just saying a little bit okay. about their Yes, where so from. I haven't been on, I had a residency at Big Bend National Park as their artist in residence in 2015. And then in, uh, I applied for another residency um, in Gettysburg uh, National Military Park and got that. It's not happened yet. It's coming up in the summer uh, of uh, 2018. So July, two weeks in July, two weeks in August. Actually gonna stay at a farm that was on the battlefield um, right right across from uh, Pickett's Charge. So, so as I've been ramping, I had a long ramp up, which was really nice, because Big Ben wasn't like that. Um, I've been reading a lot about the war and and I'm, I'm someone who I can take in just enough, and then I have to release some of it. Um, my husband said to me the other day, he's like, you know, I think we need to stop reading some Civil War for a little bit. Because you know? <laughs> he said, every subject turns to the Civil War. You know? <laughs> oh, it's so true. The other day I caught myself doing that. I thought, you're right. <laughs> you know. But anyway, that's what. Um, one of the things I, I think is so uh, gripping about these paintings in particular is how um, you s the, the kind of contrast between, again, you have the sort of luminosity, you have the sort of gentle sky um, with the sort of clouds swathing the light, and, um, and then you have these trees that are broken and, as you title it, frayed. And I wonder, um, I mean, what I like about them is the way that they capture a, a creation that it both um, is groaning and also a heavens that are declaring the glory of God at the same time. I, I appreciate the way that they're able to live into that sort of tension. Um, but I wonder if you can say more about how you see these paintings, um, and especially if you see them as beautiful or striving after beauty. Mm. Yeah, I, I never think to myself, well, I'm, I'm going to make something look beautiful. I um, I, I always think about the light first. Where's my light source and what am I, you know, that kind of thing. So that always was the first thing. I'll just tell you, when I first started this one, the tree that you're looking at, it, I had a very bright sky in the back and it just was not the right mood. Um, and so taking sort of Civil War colors, I guess, I, I was thinking about the gray and the blue. Um, and I was thinking about the African American and I was thinking about the butternut color too. and I, I just found a lot of neutrals. Isn't that interesting to me that when you mix them all together, it becomes a very calm color? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that seems something spiritual to me there. Um, and the tree wasn't just the Emancipation Proclamation at one point. To me, it was looking at our own day. The, do we need to revisit this? Do we need to revisit the Emancipation Proclamation in our day? I, I think about that. I, um, you know, I had a dream, honestly, about this painting, and I was painting another one at the time, and I literally had to take that one off the easel and put this one on. And um, but the the dream, I had a red band across the horizon, and and I remember just thinking about that. And anyway, the the the. It's hard to put words into things. I use a lot of contrasts. We're talking about silhouettes and dark and light, dark and light, because it makes a stronger statement when they do that. 
And so that's why the tree hits the light. It's not to the side or, or the light's not muted. I wanted that statement to be the strongest one. So it's really interesting about starting with the light source, which makes a lot of sense, but it um, reminds me of especially a lot of medieval paintings and um, where, and even some Renaissance paintings where the light source is Christ in the painting. So you might see like paintings of the nativity and the light's not coming like from the stars or below, the light is emanating from the little baby Christ and it sort of hits the faces of Mary. And there's something, um, I, there's something sort of evocative of divine presence about the way light shows up in your yeah. paintings. Thank you. I, I love this thought. Don't you love that thought? She, she's so wonderful. And I just, oh, just a treasure to get to know her this week, y'all. She's just, and she's this way all the time. That's, you know. I mean, you should see me when I get home. So, <laughs> I, I want to say something about that color, though. I think what she was saying, so true. Can I just share, a, a, like, an artist's thought about the Bible? Um, oh, I'm going to anyway. Anyway. <laughs> so, we look at Revelation, and we see the coming of the Lord Jesus, and the, the, the New Jerusalem is coming down. And, okay, our visible spectrum of color comes from the sun. Can you imagine the spectrum of color that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? And the color, that luminous color, and, and to me, the marriage of nature and city. In perfect union, in perfect union, clean and good and full. And I know how, you know, Gandalf says the far green country, that's how I think of it too. And, and I love that idea that the light is it's so much more than what we know. Mm -hmm. There's so much more than what we see. So, I wonder that what it um, what it means for you for someone to behold your paintings. Do you think that um, Christians get different things out of your paintings than non-Christians, or that you you miss something if you're not a Christian beholding your painting? Like, what what difference does that make mm -hmm. in beholding your work? That's such a good question too. I I really try to. <laughs> stay out of it, you know, like if they're having a moment or something, but it does delight me when someone grabs me, you know, and they say, come here, you have to tell me, <laughs> you know, or something. Or actually what they usually do is want to react with it. And, and I'm trying, as one of my th points is try just to get a feeling of a place. And um, I've, had, I've, I've had people just say, you know, I don't know why, but there's just something there that, that uh, I say this, my mentor says, it's nature, but it's not nature. Does that make sense? And they'll say that, that the unbeliever friend or whoever will say that to me. And I'll say, yes, you're right. <laughs> it's be back to you, exactly right. It's a window because it is a spiritual thing. Um, and it very easily leads to conversations, very easily and natural. I don't have to bring out any, you know, um, thing uncomfortably, it's just there, um, and and I love that. I love the conversation like that. Now with Christians, I sometimes have a little harder time just being honest with you because sometimes they want to see, um, you know, oh that's the hope. Oh that's uh, that's you know redemption's coming. You know, and I think well, that's not what I painted. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I I think we're too quick sometimes to um, spiritualize what that might mean and I try let me just say this to try to slow down time a little that's why I love paintings it stops time and and it makes you say that moment stop 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 <laughs> quiet and and we as Christians need to do that don't we more um, so. yeah I think that's really um, a kind of discipline that the paintings ask us for, right to yes. to take yes. them in to pause to contemplate and it's probably a good practice for us to help us in prayer right to yeah. make our prayers not just bossing God around absolutely <laughs> sort of pausing to listen absolutely. to give attention and the paintings are asking for that same kind of attention yes yes and that's why you need to take your children to museums <laughs> and art galleries you really do because it teaches them to slow down and not race through the pictures on a, on a screen, you know, swipe, 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 swipe. 
um, telling people all the time, you, you haven't seen nature, if that's what you've mm -hmm. seen. That's not at all the experience mm -hmm. of nature. Nature's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's little you and big him. Yeah. And I love that feeling. I love it. Well, with these, these two paintings in particular, what do you hope someone walks away with? I mean, if you don't want them to come and impose this grid that they already have on it, you want them to take in the paint, like what would you consider like, oh, this is a successful encounter with my artwork? I, I find it's, it, it's a, I feel like I've hit it when I've hit an emotion. <laughs> so even if they hate it, I think, all right, well, something hit it, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, the, the frayed on the edge is, um, it was, I was reading two biographies at the same time. Uh, Sam Watkins was a Confederate soldier in the first Tennessee uh, went through a lot of horrific, horrific battles. Shiloh was the worst, and um, and then Elisha Hunt Rhodes, who was in the second Rhode Island, um, and he was in, uh, and and then he also went through lots, and con and also Gettysburg was his worst. Mm -hmm. And so taking these two men simultaneously and seeing how they both felt so frayed at the end, and through it felt so frayed, and and then when I stepped back. And all this stuff was happening in our country. I felt so, f like I had said something about our country and not even know knowing it. I'd gone back in history to say something that happened now, mm. it felt like to me. And uh, I just like these raw trees. You know, they're not, they're not pretty. They're just yeah. raw, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I love this idea that's come up both in your, your work with the kids and in Juvie and today, that landscapes have an emotion and a story to them. Right. Um, you don't think of them as having a story because there's not obvious characters and plot, but, but they do, they evoke a kind of story. They do, absolutely evoke a story. And um, I'm, I'm somebody who loves, I love myth and fairy tale, and I'm, you know, C.S. Lewis fan to the, to the T. Mm -hmm. So, um, and remember that's what drew him in to God was, was the fairy stories and mm -hmm. things, I believe, the landscape is exuding. It's wet with, with it, and, and the spirituality. And, and, and let me just give an example. Um, um, a young mother, and forgive me, I can't remember her name. First name was Susan, but she lived in Oxford, and she had four children, and her oldest son uh, had the Junior Oxford Dictionary, and she was thumbing through it and noticed that um, the words vicar, psalm, Hackberry, blackberry, these trees uh, mm -hmm. were all dropped from her from the junior Oxford Junior Dictionary, and words like broadband, bandwidth, interface, internet were added. Something interesting that the spiritual words were dropped as well as the landscape words, as well as nature words. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. I think those are connected. If you look in your Bibles, just all. <laughs> the Bible starts with the tree, ends with the tree, <laughs> center the tree. There's this wonderful water running through it, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> You'll see all through these different landscapes that the Lord works out and through. And so, yeah, I just think there's so many stories the, Lord, the landscape is beckoning us to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. Trees and water and light, right? Yes. In scripture. <laughs> Um, so I want to turn to a final grouping. On the way, I just want to show you this. I'm sorry, this side of the room. Oh, no, you can see it too. Um, this marvelous uh, painting that I hope you have time to ask Don about, because I don't think we are in the final six minutes here. But the grouping I want to turn your attention to is, now which one is this one called, Don? Yeah, so is this Whisper? Like, whisper, thank you. She knows my titles more than I do. And that's memory. memory. And this one's presence. Right. Um, so, I mean, you can probably guess why I wanted to group them together, which is that um, there's a similarity to them, right? They've all got you, these misty mountains and these muted colors um, with, you know, a light sort of coming from behind the clouds, um, but not nearly as prominent as in your other pieces, which have a much more prominent light. Um, but what's striking also about these paintings is that they look very similar, but they have 
three quite different origins. Right. And so can you say something about the difference in these paintings and their different origins and right. how you see that difference visually represented? I was very, I, I was, I was very affected by Makoto Fujimura's uh, book, Silence and Beauty, and then going to see the film Silence. And actually, ha the process was I read Mako's first, then read the book Silence, then went to the film Silence. That was my process. I'm not saying that's the right way, but that was what I did. And I, I realized later, I, when I painted this painting, it was right in the middle of all that. And I thought, oh, it's, this is about Mako's paint. It, this is about Mako's uh, work. and. Um, and also Indo. And I, I felt that in the movie, um, Mist was a character. It, it veiled things and it, 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 helped, it, it helped hide. And it also was a, a sense of how the spirituality was clouded. You know, and I, I just wanted to say something about that because uh, when I look at mountains and you see them veiled like that, mm. there's this mystery to them, right? Um, Nan Shepherd, who was an avid hiker in the Scotland, she's on the Scottish Note, by the way, and she has this wonderful book called The Living Mountain. She says, you don't go to the top of a mountain, you go into a mountain. Don't you love that? That's spiritual thought. Mm. As we walk into a mountain, we take the topography of it into our bodies. We feel how hard it is to climb that mountain. So that when we read in the, in the Psalms, my foot is upon you, a rock. You are my mountain, my strength. Oh, then I know it. It's true, Lord. Right? And so that was really what I was thinking with the mountains. Are also show up pretty importantly mm -hmm. in Scripture, don't they? Absolutely. Mount Absolutely. Sinai, Mount Horeb. Right. Um, right. You have mountains as places of revelation, but right. revelation that um, can't be quite ca captured down below. Right. Right. Um, um, so I love the way that the mist um, in all of them mm -hmm. is suggesting yeah. that to me. The way that the mountains have some sort of um, mystery or revelation that can't quite be fully given. Yes, it, exactly. Uh, I look. I love mist. I love it because I don't know what's there. Um, um, there's this mixture of fear and awe and beauty. It's called the sublime. Um, and, and I love that feeling, and Miss does that. Um, in this particular piece, this is Big Ben National Park, and I can remember just feeling that. And it was like, oh, how long do I have to stand here until it overtakes me mm. into its smoke, you know? And that, yeah. Wouldn't that be great, that yeah. feeling? And I think about the temple. The temple was filled with smoke. Mm. And the presence of God was always veiled in cloud, was it not? Right? Right? When he came, he came in a storm. He came in a cloud. And I look at that and we can't, we can't take it. So he veils himself, you know. Um, exactly, just this morning driving here, I thought, thank you, Lord, there's a little mist. <laughs> there was. <laughs> there yeah. was, yeah. Veiling the skyscrapers of Dallas. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the middle long one, is called Memory. This was from my, my reading of Gettysburg. It has a tiny, tiny bird, and kind of not center, but to yeah. the right. Mm -hmm. And um, just thinking of a landscape affected by the memory of war. Um, what does that do to a landscape? When I go to Gettysburg, I'm not painting m monuments. I'm not painting battles. I'm, I'm not painting any figurative things. I'm painting the landscape. But the, the landscape has effect, been affected by that. Um, we look at 600,000 men who died in the Civil War. If you combined all the other American wars, it's still not the same amount as the Civil War. And our Earth took that in to itself. And now that you go down to Gettysburg, I'm expecting to see beautiful clipped you know, lawns and things like that. But what does it mean that a landscape takes that in to itself and regrows again? Something spiritual there to me. Um. Yeah, I love that idea that a landscape can tell a story that happened 150 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, um, we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask, can you imagine your paintings helping someone worship better? And if so, how would that happen? Yeah. You know, I, I, they help me worship better 
if I'm, I'm, it's all about selfish, I guess, but it's, it's one of those things of like, I need to be around this. I need to be around a, a good world and I need to point out when it's not good. Um, and, and the world is crumbling under our feet. It really is, but let, let me point out the beauty while we can. Um, and it leads me to worship. Beauty always leads me to worship. It always leads me to this place when, um, where I'm being with it. I was, uh, this summer, my husband has this beautiful, um, or his parents have this beautiful land in Illinois, and I was si sitting out there and these fireflies just started coming around me. And I thought about how that's what fireflies, it's being with them. You know, it, if I had told you about the fireflies, which I'm doing right now, or even the painting itself, it's not the same, is it? It's the being with them. And that always leads me to worship, always, because he is a with us God. It's this enchanting, beautiful God, this mystery God, you know. That's, that's lovely, Don, the, the sort of lesson of presence, which is really the story of God's life with us, right? God's presence to us as creator, God's continually giving God's presence to us, even in the face of our rejection, our tables crashing. Um, God giving us God's presence even unto death, and us learning how to give our presence back to God. Thank you for thank being present you. with me, and thank you all for, for your attention both today and over the last week. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all.